As the Hawthorne Football Club prepares for another big game, there's a lot more than four premiership points at stake. The 1993 Hawks carry with them the history and tradition of a club that had to struggle for more than 80 years before it tasted the success of a premiership and liked the taste so much that its appetite has never been satisfied. Most of the 1993 players weren't even born when Hawthorne won that first premiership 32 years ago. But no one at the club is allowed to forget those long years of struggle and the dedication, desire and fighting spirit that was required to break the cycle of failure. You know, when I joined the club, we were on the bottom of the ladder. From memory, I think we had £7,000 as total assets and a few bootlaces. And uh, it's an enormous integrity amongst some pretty fine men who uh, were totally dedicated to see uh, Hawthorne become a football power. The club, I think, constantly is related to its origins, and so, you know, there's just that relentless pressure all the time to get up and stay there. I think uh, in one uh, reading I recall that they were, Hawthorne were called the Lily Whites, you know, had a Lily White attitude to, to get the going, and they'll never succeed whilst that existed. That Lily White attitude has long gone at Hawthorne. The modern day Hawks are accustomed to winning. But now the 1993 players have created some history of their own. Another dimension to the Hawthorne tradition. They have earned a place in the finals for a remarkable 12th season in a row. The longest run of success at the top level in Australian football history. It's a record that may well stand for all time. When the run began in 1982, the club had four VFL Premiership Cups. Ten years later, it had nine, including one in the new National League. The rules had been changed time and time again as the administrators tried to even up the competition, but still the Hawks' dominance continued. Often they looked down and out, and many commentators were quick to predict their fall from the top of the tree. Too old, too slow became a catch cry as predictable as the club's resurgence, often in the face of severe adversity. The club was just getting kicked in the bum all the time for so darn long when they entered the VFL as it was in those days and for what 35 years they never participated in a final. It's been an amazing phenomenon to, to watch it from inside for the first few years and then from outside for the uh, uh, for the duration. It is a record to, to create something that uh, has not been done before and will certainly under the current structure and system where football is heading will never, in my opinion, and that's a silly thing to say, but it can never, ever happen again. One of the most astonishing things about Hawthorne's record-breaking run of success in the 80s and 90s is the fact that, for most of its history, the only records set by Hawthorne were associated with wooden spoons. Formed in 1873, the club's first 30 years were spent playing in various junior competitions, moving its home from paddock to paddock in what was then the outer eastern fringe of Melbourne. Even in those early junior days, there is no evidence of any significant success. In 1902, Hawthorne joined the Metropolitan League and in 1906 made its home at Glenferry Oval. By the time the club joined the Victorian Football Association in 1914, it was 40 years old and had gone through at least five changes of uniform. It was on joining the VFA that Hawthorne changed to brown and gold colours, abandoning the blue and gold already worn by VFA rival Williamstown. By 1922, fairly regular victories began to occur. Then in 1923, the club, coached by Bill Walton, made the VFA finals for the first and only time, finishing fourth. Due to its lack of success, Hawthorne was somewhat of a surprise selection to join an expanded Victorian Football League in 1925, along with Footscray and North Melbourne. Now and then as the Maybloom's, the club had developed a loyal following among the community in the growing eastern suburbs. 
The Maybloom's hardly took the VFL by storm. They finished on the bottom of the ladder in that first year and proceeded to accumulate a further nine wooden spoons in the 26 years up to the start of the 1950s. The Maybloom's had earned a reputation as the Easy Beats. The club had some fine coaches in this period and some great players, but never enough, it seems, at the same time. The best season of the dark years was 1943. Under coach Roy Cazale, of up there Cazale fame, the team managed nine wins and six losses and narrowly missed the finals on percentage after going down to North Melbourne by one point in the last round. It was the first season in the VFL that the club had won more games than it had lost. Cazale's more lasting contribution was to announce to the players, apparently without consulting the committee, that they would no longer be known as the Mayblooms. He considered the title sissy and felt it made the team appear beaten before it ran out. From that day, said Cazale, they would be known as the Hawks. At the start of uh, the, the 50s, probably, um, uh, Hawthorne was looked upon as a little bit of an easy easy uh, game for others, but by the end of the 50s, I think perhaps we were uh, treated with a little bit more respect. The 1950s began with one of the worst years in Hawthorne's so far undistinguished history. A bitter pre-season row over the captaincy resulted in former captain and coach Alex Orbiston and Brownlow medal runner-up Col Austin quitting the club. And for the second time in the VFL, the club went through an entire season without winning a single game. Who could have foreseen that such a devastating turn of events would be the springboard for the club's climb up the ladder? With hindsight, we know that one reason was the arrival of an awkward young ruckman named John Kennedy, whose leadership qualities soon began to show. Another reason was coach Bob McCaskill, a man ahead of his time. McCaskill instilled a sense of aggression into the players. To start with, he initiated a change in the jumper, from brown with gold yoke to brown and gold stripes, declaring that it made the players look bigger and stronger. And while losing was still the order of the day, McCaskill taught his players to hate it. When the visionary coach died suddenly in 1952, he was succeeded by his deputy, Jack Hale, who told the players they were all one mob and exhorted them to believe in themselves and in one another. In the same period, a band of astute administrators found their way to Hawthorne and the club's recruiting improved sharply. Hawthorne had very rarely made headlines, but it did in 1954 with the recruiting coup of South Australian beanpole, Candles Thompson. The hype that came with that, and Hawthorne at that stage were getting publicity they'd never enjoyed before, and in the, buying the sporting club in Bendigo, to see Hawthorne on the front page, it, it gave everybody a sense that uh, there's something going on here that uh, uh, I wouldn't mind being a part of. John Kennedy, Roy Simmons and others were already top players and they were joined by a steady stream of talented recruits, most from country Victoria and eastern suburbs private schools. Graham Arthur, who was to be one of the club's all-time great players, arrived from Bendigo in 1955. When I came down here I could also sense that uh, the professionalism of the club, you know, Dr Ferguson uh, as president was a uh, a man of standing and, uh, and people around him were all uh, people that uh, uh, had one idea, get Hawthorne up the, up the ladder. And up the ladder they went. In 1956, the reserves became the first Hawthorne team to make the finals and the seniors followed in 1957. And that first senior final saw a triumphant victory over the mighty Carlton by 23 points after a hailstorm lashed the MCG at half-time, by which time the Hawks had established a handy lead. But a thrashing by all conquering Melbourne in the preliminary final showed the club still had a way to go. The finals proved to be out of the club's reach in 1958 and 59, but the reserves won back-to-back -back premierships and gave the club the confidence that it was on the right track. Then in 1960, the club faced a momentous decision. Committee man Ron Cook approached John Kennedy about coaching the club. I spoke to John, I said, look, we want to have a talk to you about how your reaction would be to coaching the club. And I can assure you that neither of the three of us 
got one word in for 30 minutes whilst John told us how unfit most league teams were, the discipline that he would apply with play in front, off the toes, knock the wall to, ball towards the goals and and uh, get on with the game. And, and uh, if there was a meeting held that night, we would have been, you know, we were carried away. So we did support strongly <clears throat> the appointment of, of John Kennedy as coach. I thought that if we could get a side far fitter than had ever been before. There was sufficient margin there in fitness that if we applied that to the game, we could, we could win matches and win them consistently. Alarmingly, the initial results were disastrous. The Hawthorne players made blunder after blunder as they adapted to the new style of play and lost their first five games of the 1960 season. Kennedy did not deviate from his strategy and gradually it began to work. He said, uh, win the last six, win the last six and uh, we'll get in there on, on percentage and uh, we can win it from there. And we won the last six but missed out on percentage to Collingwood and uh, it was a bit of blow to, the, to us who had great faith in John and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and not often he was wrong you know, in saying win the last six and you were in. Uh, this time he was missed by about two percent I think it was. Along the way, they achieved the club's first ever win over Collingwood at Victoria Park by one point when full forward John Peck booted a goal after the siren. Kennedy used the win to demonstrate that his methods were correct. This particular incident, uh, Ian Mort had the ball uh, just, in the, uh, just uh, before the end of the match and he took the mark in the mud and just turned around and kicked it without any sort of uh, deliberation, it seemed that way, he just kicked it and John Peck who was up at full forward, he knew that Pecky, that uh, Morty would kick it. He was in front, grabbed the ball, marked the ball and the bell went and of course we won it and as soon as um, we came off the field I said now if Morty went back for his kick we'd have been beaten and uh, Milo, it reached ridiculous lengths from then on, at least, at least the message was, uh, was clear. The tempo was stepped up even further in 1961 and after an indifferent start of the season, the side strung together 10 wins in a row to finish on top of the ladder. The biggest threat was Melbourne, which had won five of the past six premierships. But there was no stopping the Hawks now and they survived a fiery and gruelling second semi-final to win by seven points and earn their place in the grand final. An exhausted Melbourne was defeated by Footscray in the preliminary final and the two clubs, which had joined the VFL together in 1925, lined up in an historic grand final. Well, our play has just started in the 1961 grand final between Hawthorne and Footscray. Gardner turns well, plays on, down into the full forward zone. Witten is there and he's taken the mark. Well, there was nothing wrong with his leg that time, Rich. Oh, no, Jeff, he came out the full lot then. Here he comes. The kick is a good one. It's through, I would say, for another goal, oh, yes. Back it comes to the centre-half forward position for Hawthorne. Oh, tapped by Hawthorne, but there's no Hawthorne player there. It was nearly got away by Ware. He got a bit of a surprise himself, and now Brendan Edwards comes in, has a shot. No, but hit as he got rid of the ball, and he's laying on the ground. He got hit very hard then, but meantime, the ball has gone down, and it's a goal to Hawthorne. Driving along the uh, grandstand wing here, players set themselves and oh, Whitten went a tremendous height, failed to hold it, over to Schultz, Schultz a uh, big handball, but uh, it uh, goes into the hands of um, the Hawthorne defender, and now Footscray, or Hawthorne rather, into attack, Footscray defending hotly, here's a chance for um, Ian Morty, drives right up. The mark has been taken there, a very, very easy one. A sitter has been taken by John Peck. Yes, Waiting right. for Peck to take his kick now. He couldn't miss this, could he? Oh, no, he has. Every time. I would be the worst tipster ever. That's most remarkable, Jeff, isn't it? It is, Reg. Oh, look at this. Whitten allowed to go up unopposed. Marks the kick. He's uh, about the centre-half forward position. Four foot square as he comes in. He won't get the distance from here, but he should put it right down in the goal square. It's a beautiful punt kick. It's travelling just into the goal square. It drops. No one can mark the ball. And what has happened? A free kick has been pulled out of it, and it could go. It could go to McKellar here. He's going back to take his kick. Barney McKellar. He had a shot from here just a moment ago for Footscray. 
See what he does with it this time. Right foot and it's through the middle. It's a goal. Yes. A bit scrambly around the centre there and eventually it's uh, Fisher, no Law, who comes out with it for Hawthorne. Out of the half forward flank, a chance for Brendan Edwards now. He's not being shepherded though to go through. He likes to, to do a hand pass. There's a free kick but play on says the umpire as Edwards has a shot and with a glorious drop kick puts it right through the centre for another goal to Hawthorne. A the Bulldogs jumped to an eight point Edwards lead at half time but the coach wasn't concerned. But I thought by half time when I was coming up the race and I was watching the football, the Footscray players come up beside us, I thought they seemed really tired to me. They looked tired and then when we ran out afterwards, I thought our fellows ran out with a bit more bounce in their step than the Footscray players. The forward pocket, a chance for Graham Arthur to mark and he does so. Graham, the uh, hawk skipper. Coming in to take his kick right down into the teeth of goal. They set themselves up. They go and the mark has been pulled down for Hawthorne by uh, Hill. Coming in to take his kick, tries to run around. He kicks and, yes, in the first few seconds of the third quarter, Hawthorne have booted a goal. Picked up now and driven right into attack. A chance for uh, Peck to mark. No, it's dropped. Or rather, Hill to mark. It's dropped. Stacks on the mill now and the free kick has been given to Hawthorne. Cunningham comes in to take his kick. And it's another one. What a fiery opening by the Hawks. Gary Young is uh, about 50 yards out from goal. His kick, it's a beauty. It's a ripper, this kick. Up they go. It's almost marked right in the teeth of goals there. But eventually, it's Law trying to get his foot to it. Can't do so. He's tackled by players right, left and centre. And eventually, it's kicked. Snapped up very quickly and kicked by Graham Arthur, a captain's effort from the skipper of the Hawks. Hawthorne have the opportunity here. Gary Young picks up, drives down towards goal. Hill sets himself. Oh, everybody out of position. Nobody at home. The ball is on the ground. It's picked up by Cunningham, it looks like, is it? Trying to know. It's uh, Morton Brown. Morton Brown picks it up and uh, puts it through for another goal to the Hawks. Duran underruns it, but he'll pick it up again. I think he's got time to turn around, recover, turn out of trouble, get his left foot to the ball, put it right onto the half-forward flank for Hawthorne. Three Hawthorne players there, one of them must get it. It'll be a kick for goal, and it could go through again for another goal, and it has! The Hawks unleashed a sensational six-goal third quarter and went on to wrap up the club's first senior premiership by 43 points. Duran comes in, there's the final siren, the final siren. And Hawthorne are premiers for the year 1961. Hawthorne had finally learned how to win. Well, I suppose it was just magical, though. <clears throat> being the first one, uh, nobody knows what to do. <laughs> we didn't know how to celebrate, probably, the way that uh, other clubs had, uh, had done, had won a, a few premierships. That night, 6,000 supporters were at Glen Ferry Oval. Personally, I've always able, been able to laugh at football, but I got a bit more serious that day because I came down here after the uh, grand final and there were old people, over 80, who came up to us and, um, and little kids of under six who were coming up. And, uh, and I thought, well, it meant so much to these people, people who weren't interested in making a, a dollar on the side, but people who were just interested in the other things, you know things that that perhaps um uh are not a, not to do with just just ordinary life and it was a wonderful experience and i think the players understood this too they saw how much it mattered to people and uh, uh it sort of made the game took the game took on a, a new meaning for me then that first premiership had been one of the three major objectives set for the club by Dr Sandy Ferguson when he took over as president in 1953. The others were for the club to become ground manager at Glen Ferry Oval and for a licensed club to be established. By 1962, all three objectives had been achieved. Dr Ferguson worked hard to unify the club and create a feeling that the boot stutter was as important as the president the sort of philosophy that led to Hawthorne becoming known as the family club. Dr Ferguson used to tell newcomers, if you embrace Hawthorne, Hawthorne will embrace you. 
The trainers and other backroom staff developed their own camaraderie and began the practice of cooking sausages for players, officials and supporters after training. A family barbecue every Thursday night. It still happens today. In 1962, the Hawks appeared to suffer a premiership hangover. Not helped by the loss of key players and a spate of injuries, they won only five games. But in 1963, it was back to business. A second grand final appearance. Umpire Jeff Crouch bounces off and the battle is on. The Hawks are strong and bustling. The Cats, speedy and polished. It's the 13th minute and Woodley kicks the Hawks' first goal and they recover the lead. Olsen is there to send the ball goalwards where Law is positioned and snaps Hawthorne's second goal. Defending desperately, Hawthorne are in trouble as Hines from a mishandle gathers the crumbs and goals. Finishing off the movement, Nichols goals to all but set the seal on the Premiership. Unfortunately, Hawthorne was no match on the day for a skillful Geelong combination. John Kennedy left the club due to teaching commitments and was replaced by Graham Arthur for two years and then Peter O'Donoghue. Another good season in 1964 came to an unlucky end when a freak Melbourne goal in the last minute of the second last game at Glen Ferry nudged the stunned Hawks out of the four. Bottom of the ladder in 1965 and ninth in 1966, it looked like the club had again lost its way. Peter was, wasn't an easy player to recruit, but the great quality about Peter Hudson was his great honesty and his own personal integrity. And he promised me that he would sign with Hawthorne. And he played in a practice game here in uh, about 64, I think. And he kicked 10 goals as an 18-year-old. And in those days, the, uh, there was two virtual world of sports. There was the Channel 9 and Channel 7. So I well remember Murray Wiedemann saying, and I've seen a champion of the future, and what's more, your other clubs, this player's unsigned. It was Peter Hudson, but he honoured his word. And, and, and the great part about Peter Hudson, when he was signed for the second time for him to come over, we were dead set bottom of the ladder. Hudson's arrival in 1967 coincided with the return of John Kennedy as coach. He was the one person that I'd met in my life that led by just sheer example, and he's... As an older person, he was able to run and push his body uh, in that light and expected us to do similar deeds. After a disappointing return season in 1967, Kennedy decided that the answer, once again, was superior fitness. A fitness farm was established at Bulleen. Intensive weightlifting and motor fitness tests were introduced and the players were put through a rigorous program. Soon, they became known as Kennedy's Commandos. A sustained recruiting drive over the next two years introduced a series of potential stars. Apart from Hudson, the list included Peter Crimmins, Bob Keddy, Des Maher, Ian Bremner, Kelvin Moore, Alan Martello, Don Scott, Lee Matthews and Peter Knights. The team was constructed around Hudson, who in 1968 became the first Hawthorne player to kick 100 goals and the following year bagged 16 in one match against Melbourne. Losses in the first seven games of 1970 led to a wasted season. But 1971 was a different story. The Hawks finished on top of the ladder with 19 wins and three losses. A winning ratio rarely equaled and never surpassed in the club's history. They looked certainties for the flag, but a talented and determined St Kilda side, coached by Alan Jeans, finished best in the second semi-final, with the Hawks grimly hanging on and making their third grand final by just two points. Up against the Saints again on the last Saturday in September, Hudson was on 147 goals for the season and needed just four to break Bob Pratt's record. And the biggest crowd ever to see a Hawthorne team play, over 118,000, was at the MCG 
to see one of the most memorable grand finals ever. Hudson Murray behind him. Hudson's mark. Hudson's mark. He would be from that angle some 45 to 50 yards away from the big sticks. Kicking down to the Richmond end. The rain coming down now at the MCG. Peter Hudson, four goals to go to break the record. But more important, kicking Hawthorne towards the Premiership. The kick's on its way. It's a beautiful kick. He's put it through. He's put it through. Through Kane Murray there. The ball knocked away. Looks like Murray's in a bit of trouble. They go through. Hudson's bowled over. And Hudson's hurt. Close play, and it's going to be hard to, uh, to kick goals quickly and score in a free manner. Hawthorne now going forward down towards Hudson. Oh, good lucky to get out of that, uh, St Kilda. Hudson uh, got it in the back, but he kicks down and he kicks through. As his second, a fantastic kind of recovery. Up they go in the centre. The ball knocked away. It's going up into Hawthorne's territory. Go almost taken by Heath. I'm about to say taken, but he didn't get it cleanly. Kicked by Ma. Out comes Hudson. Oh, in the back. In the back, there is no shadow of doubt. 149 goals up. He is 20 yards out on a slight angle. 149 goals up. Kicking to the scoreboard end. He kicks. 150. Hawthorne's half forward flank on the other side. There's a siren ending the second quarter. He seems a little push, recovers quicker and has more pace than anybody else. Comes around and drives it down towards centre half forward. Up they fly. Green takes the mark. That's called play on by the umpire. He recovers quicker than any Hawthorne player and comes around and drives it towards goal. Is it a loser? The big fella, Ditwich goes up, Scott's with him, down to Davis, it comes, he's well tackled, over to Smith, however, Smith from the pocket, kicks, don't tell me, he's put it through. By three-quarter time, St Kilda had forged to a commanding 20-point lead, and it looked ominous. At three-quarter time, I thought, well, what a shame, as I was walking out, you know, that if this is going to be that one day, because we were four or five goals down, and the ball wasn't all that light, it was a pretty heavy day, and uh, all that talent... And um, I guess the players could see how desperate I was. That, uh, and I think they sort of, perhaps for the first time, could see defeat staring them in the eyes. They were well in control of the game. And I can remember John Kennedy saying something along the lines that, well, if we're going to go down, we should go down in a glorious way. We shouldn't uh, show the flag. And John was always disturbed that a Hawthorne team might give up or appear to give up. And, uh, and I can remember though I was captain, I can remember Scotty in fact saying, what's he talking about? We'll win it. I thought, well, geez, we only, you only get here once maybe in, in your lifetime. And uh, I can also remember other things that he said about, you know, the amount of training that you put in, you know, running up and down Wattle Park, sweating it out, getting up and probably doing as much, if not more than any opposition. So why surrender all the work that you've done, you know, and all you've got is 25 minutes, which could mean the difference between winning and losing. He's been manhandled, taken by Kenny. Here comes little Crimmins. Crimmins has it, he's running into an open goal. He kicks. He's put it through. 12 yards out, directly in front. He kicks. Hawk on in front. Looks straight towards Don Scott. He whips it over towards Kenny. Field. Oh, he's no more than eight yards out. He should kick it. Up he comes. He kicks. Oh! Taken by Matthews. Matthews, a hand pass to Hudson. Hudson going for a run. He steadies. He kicks. Oh, my God, he's missed it. Oh, look at him. Goes to the flank position on the outer side. The sun comes out as the ball hits the ground and Heath sends it back to the wing position. Simon goes. Simon goes. Hawthorne, our premiers, 1971. The Hawks' second premiership was followed by a letdown, just as the first had been. And for two years, they missed the September action. A major factor was a serious knee injury that put Peter Hudson out of football in 1972. But the nucleus of a strong side was still there. And finally, 101 years after the club was formed, 
Hawthorne was about to come of age as a football power. In the 70s, it was a supreme effort, a mental effort, more than ability that won uh, premierships for Hawthorne. In 1973, the committee decided that Glen Ferry Over was no longer a viable home ground and the club moved to share Prince's Park with Carlton the following year. The move was to coincide with the birth of a golden era. The Hawks looked the goods for much of 1974 but could not overcome North Melbourne in two attempts in the finals and bowed out in the preliminary final. On the eve of the finals, it was learned that Peter Crimmins, the inspirational little blonde-headed rover now captaining the club, was battling cancer. Early in the 1975 season, John Kennedy told the players that Crimmins' cancer had returned and worsened and he would miss several months football while undergoing treatment. The Hawks went into the finals on top of the ladder. The win over North by 11 points in the second semi-final put them into the grand final. But one of the most traumatic incidents in the club's history was to follow. Peter Crimmins had recovered sufficiently to play five games in the reserves and desperately wanted to lead the club to a premiership. But was he fit enough to make his comeback in the biggest game of the year? After an agonising discussion and a split vote, the selectors decided against it. I suppose you have a hunch that if you played Peter, it, it would have had an effect on the rest of the team. But we didn't. And we'll never know whether that would have happened or not. But uh, there was great trauma about it and, uh, and indeed a good deal of sadness. As sad as the decision was, there was still a grand final to be played. North Melbourne versus Hawthorne. Grabbed, oh, he's tipped up the more, but he gets the kick back. Oh, oh, nice. Scott, Nolan from behind, they both tap it down actually. Gumbelin comes in there, takes the kick. Oh, it's close to the boundary line. Trotter's in front there, but over the top comes Martello to take the mark. The hand pass comes across here to Davis. Davis, oh, over the Dench. Dench runs into Welch. He's grabbed. When Dench is in trouble, he's gone for a pass. It's all right. And Blight's dropped the mark. Good play on the part of Moore. Kekovic and Javorski are there. Comes down to Cable. Cable tries a short one out here towards Burns. Burns runs around. He straightens up. He shoots. It's another one. There's a go now for North. There's Blight going to the goals. He fires. And a goal. And an easy mark to Jaworski who drives the ball a long way up towards the forward zone. Croswell and Hendry. Croswell can't pick it up. Hendry's battling. Hendry goes after it again. He knocks it over to Maher. He fires for the goals. And it looks like one point to me. It is one point. Gumbledon from the halfback flank. Hand passes to Cowton. Cowton gets it across here to Malcolm Blight. Malcolm Blight gets it down into the forward zone once again. No mark. Chance here for Burns. He's going to be tackled by Welsh. A long hand pass to Arnold Brightus. Ryder steadies, he shoots at the big ones, and there's another one! The players put in their worst performance of the year, going down by nearly 10 goals to North Melbourne, which had ended a 50-year drought to win its first premiership. Trotter's after it, there's the Sirens! Sirens gone! North Melbourne's first ever flag! Opinions are divided on the impact of the decision to leave Crimmins out of the 1975 grand final side but the humiliating thrashing certainly led to a fierce desire gripping the club in 1976. The real supporters, and some of them are saying you didn't try. So I said, we've got to accept that that's the way it seemed. Their perception of the way we played on the day was that some of us weren't trying. And I think it's a dreadful thing to have to put up with that people perceive the way you played in such a way that you, you, they think you didn't try. The grand final day, as we know it in our game, is probably the cruelest day of, uh, of the football season because to one side goes all the spoils of victory and to the other side the, all the depression of losing, and, and that's, that's the deal. With Crimmins' condition deteriorating by the day, the players surged towards the last Saturday in September with grim determination, led superbly by Crimmins' replacement as captain, Don Scott. Before the grand final, Kennedy told them there are a lot of reasons why they had to win. Most of all, though, they had to win it for the little fella. The grand final of 1976, Hawthorne versus North Melbourne. Up it goes now. 
Ball having a go. There's Lethal Lee going for a shot at goals. He doesn't miss. There. Beautiful goal. Rollins and he'll streak away. And looking out there for uh, Moncrief. And I think Moncrief's got the mark. He'd have to mark that even though David Dent's nearly pulled him right through the ground. Let's see what he can do. Get closer to it now with this kick of Montreal. The kick looks a pretty good one to me. And now he tries one over towards Feltham. Feltham's got it. Back towards Greg. Oh, he topped one too. And down goes Lee Matthews and there's no doubt. Oh, look out. And the ball picked up by Cable, but he's pretty well collared as we see the ball grabbed now by Blight, but he's in trouble again. Finally gets a kick and a mark taken here by Simmerbush on his own on the wing position. They're really hungry for kicks, those uh, Hawks at the moment as the ball goes on. Oh, uh, Bremner got a bit of go for a goal. Hick running into an open goal, fires it through. Tuck, only about 45 metres out, he kicks. He's going to drop short, it's not clear, picked up by Kelvin Matthews. And he slams it through. Our hand pass, is it? No, he's gone for a hand pass to Feltham now. It's a dangerous one. Scott's got his gun for the goals. And it's a goal. He gets it over to Sutton. Sutton up north drives forward. They come out to meet it. Crosswell and Moore. Up goes Moore. Comes down the cable. Cable will kick off the ground. Crosswell does it. Crosswell got his boost to us. Greg on the weak position on that southern side. Drives North Melbourne forward, swings it in towards centre half forward. Up with it. Knights, but Knights from behind. Players move into position. Up goes Martello. Couldn't take the mark, however. Through comes Feltham there for North Melbourne. But the ball pushed along by Polkinghorne of uh, Hawthorne. Gets it over to Hendry. Hendry gets around the opposition. A left footer. He drives in goal. What's end? He's planted it through. The ball taken away by Cable of North Melbourne. He's going through that bit of a run. Cable kicks it over the centre. Up goes Malcolm Blight and takes the mark. Plays on immediately. The siren goes. Hawthorne have won it. Hawthorne have won the 1976 Grand Final. It was the fifth time the Hawks had beaten their 1975 conqueror during the year. Too ill to go to the MCG, Peter Crimmins listened to the match on radio. That night, a group of his closest teammates visited him with the Premiership Cup and replayed the game kick by kick. Two days later, the little fella died. At the end of 1976, with the club's only three premierships under his belt, John Kennedy retired. He had done more to shape the club into a successful unit than anyone else in Hawthorne's history. He certainly uh, had enormous influence just because of his great loyalty to the club. You know, he, he wouldn't make any decision, football and sometimes outside of football, unless, uh, you know, Hawthorne were involved. John probably influenced my life, that is uh, me the person and the sorts of uh, values and ideals and, and certainly my approaches to things including football. Um, he had just a, a, a controlling influence over that. He's a man of, um, of great oratory. He could use the uh, Queen's English like nobody else I've ever heard. David Parkin, assistant coach in 76, took over from Kennedy and quickly had the 77 Hawks rolling to the finals. A 31-year-old recruit named Peter Hudson had returned for one last season and bagged more than 100 goals for the fifth time in the VFL. But in the end, it was a wasted opportunity. With an injury-weakened side going down narrowly to Collingwood in the second semi-final and then copping a thrashing from arch-rival North Melbourne in the preliminary final. For the third time, back-to-back -back flags had proved to be an elusive dream. We didn't do it well. We should have beaten Collingwood on that day. We made some, um, some real blunders. Um, but in the finish, it suggests we just were undermanned so badly in the uh, preliminary, was it the yes, preliminary final, or whatever it is, the elimination final, that um, we were, were going to always have great difficulty winning. Once again, a disappointing September in 77 was the spur for a massive effort in 78. 
The Hawks finished second with 16 wins after a couple of touch-and-go games late in the season and won their way into their third grand final against North Melbourne in four years. The coaches' methods that year had broken new ground. It was the introduction, I think, for the first time. I don't think other teams had actually taken film, edited uh, video, and we put them together in what we call a visualisation tape. We'd taken uh, all the good things. We showed no errors. Took the best, particularly as it was North Melbourne, the best against North Melbourne. We actually superimposed um, graphics, uh, words, and all sorts of things over those pictures. And we consistently showed them in the weeks leading up. Visualisation now is, accept is a, an accepted psychological tool for all sports people to use now. I think in this country it might have been the first, um, the first time it had been used, certainly in team sports, for that sort of effect. Parkin had also been more ruthless and prepared to drop out of form players in his second year as coach. One player who got his chance was 20-year-old Robert Dippier Domenico, a last-minute selection for the grand final. What had happened an hour before the game, um, David Parkin came up and said, well, you ready? You're on brightest today. And from there I thought, wow, this is my chance, this is great, you know. And it didn't really affect me and I just sort of went out there and this big, just excitement about playing football, but also the excitement of playing in front of 121,000 people and I, on uh, only brightest, yeah. Decides to bounce it up once more. Nolan in ruck for North Melbourne. Scott over the top of him, gets the tap out, taken away by Stan Alves. Alves' kick up towards half forward, marked by DP Domenico, who is playing, as Bob Skilton mentioned, to full forward. Moncrief gets one behind the ear. It'll be 15 metres. There's Martello in the front, he got the knockout. Oh, Blight missed that, picked up by Monane. Up towards Moncrief, the danger play with... Uh, with Glenn Denning, actually Moncrief punched it out to Henry, is smothered again by Glenn Denning, back to Scott, a left foot, he's put it through, he's put it through, a beautiful goal by the Hawthorne skipper. At Knights at the back, got the sit here, and he takes them, his name is written all over that one. Well, Pockinghorn has uh, done a shocker insofar as the kick is concerned, it's up to half forward, Russo taps it out, but it's intercepted by Greg, he gets bowled over if you don't mind, couldn't pick up the ball, Scott wins his way to the situation, and by golly, I wouldn't like to be out there right now, I tell you that. North Melbourne now, go forward once more. Baker from behind. Picked up by Tanner. Tanner's kick up towards the forward line now. Here's a mark to Baker again. Well down towards the full forward zone. Baker at the back. What a mark that was by Baker. Again from behind. Has he turned out to be a real threat? This guy has already kicked three goals. Going from forward. Six marks for the quarter. Lou and David Parkin hasn't made a move. There's the kick of the for full points. And the hook North Melbourne have hit the front. And getting his a chance for Matthews. Can't get there. Now he shoots the goal and puts it through. One coming back and we see the ball driven up that time by Di Pietro Manico. But it's Run in front of Matthews, sidesteps nicely and gets the kick in. Knight's coming in to meet the ball. Possibly upset his teammate coming down the field and Knight's is down. Ball in the meantime over the line. Knight's caught the beauty. Well, I went out to him and uh, he was pretty groggy. A couple of other trainers were out assisting him and um, I said, oh, what do we do? So I said, all right, Peter, just we'll leave you for a moment and see how you feel. But he was in fairyland at the time. And all of a sudden the ball just happened to come down. And he just ran away, marked the ball and ran in and kicked a magnificent goal. Well, that was just so inspiring, that piece of play. Boots it up towards the full forward position. Knights plays. Got the mark. Got the mark. Peter Knights. Beautiful mark by Knights. He was knocked out about 10 minutes ago, but he's recovered to take that mark pretty well. Didn't mess about it through for full points. Scott winning that tap out, looking for Matthews, who picks it up on the run. Matthews fires the ball deep into attack the Hawthorne and Knights. Breaks away, he's going to have a shot for goal, I think, for the Knights, and that should look out. That's uh, Knights' second goal since he's been moved to the forward line. Looking for Ablett, who dropped the mark, a very difficult one indeed. Ablett looking to straighten up and fire for the goals. Up towards Peter Knights at the back, he flips the mark! Oh, Kelly, a mark and a half! He sides only 18 points in front, we're at the 20 or the 30 minute mark. And I'd say that it's... Uh, Hawthorne's Premiership for 1978. There it is. Hawthorne Premiers for 1978. And there's John Scott. He's going to give a present to somebody in the crowd. Hawthorne have won their fourth BFL Premiership. Yet another Premiership hangover struck the club in 1979 and the Hawks failed to make it six years in a row in the finals. 
The slide continued in 1980, and both the club and the critics searched for answers. It was generally felt that the players had been spoiled by success and were not as motivated as in the past. The committee, now led by past player Phil Ryan, began thinking about alternative coaches. And I thought it was very, very un-Hawthorne-like the way they went around the resignation of David Park and he was more or less forced into a position. In actual fact, you know, one of the committee men at that time came to me halfway through the year, even a match committee person uh, came to me halfway through the year and sounded me out about Park and David's performance and again I thought that was very un-Hawthorne-like. I think a lot of people think that I uh, had already written myself a uh, contract elsewhere and uh, the terms disloyal and uh, whatever they call people who vacate. It's not a very nice name, which I was called a few times, I think, after I left. This was my home and my life. I never considered football in any other way except through one brown and one gold eye. It was not, I resigned because, in fact, the club were looking for someone else to, um, to do the job. And unfortunately for them or for me, I found out about that. So I had no other grounds except to um, resign. It was accepted with undue haste. <laughs> Um, but in terms of uh, the future of the Hawthorne Footy Club, it was the, the right thing to do because within a very short time Hawthorne were to launch into the most successful area of, the, of this particular club. Cookie contacted me again. At, um, I was nearly had seal signed and delivered and gone to Fitzroy. Uh, he wanted me to come out for an interview that night, so I came out and had the interview. And, uh, and after the interview, I think I only asked one question through the interview. Why did you want an outsider to coach the club? And uh, Because they'd been such a tight club for such a long period of time. And uh, I don't think I really got an answer from that uh, thing, but that was the only really question I wanted to know. And uh, I went home and I discussed it with my wife. And within about an hour of that, Ron rang me again. And I said, yes, I'd take the job. Ron it was who had the... Uh who had the wisdom to see that, that Alan would be good for Hawthorne and secondly had the courage to pursue what he thought was the right thing. And I sort of came along and when I could see what he was after, I think I probably supported him. But it was his, his uh, intuition or whatever you like that got Alan here. Cook had been impressed by Gene's work at VFL level and Kennedy, now chairman of selectors, agreed Gene's had the qualities needed by the club. He was smarter than the coaches of the time that were coaching the state sides. He was the man that moved the, the board and picked the player that had to man up to beat a player in the opposition. He was the person that uh, seemed to have a far greater knowledge of the game than some of the pretty big names at the time, in my opinion. And he sort of also was a very dedicated individual and a person that wanted the challenge, again, to prove himself that he was still a good coach because he virtually relinquished a job some six or seven years beforehand at St Kilda and uh, the time was right for him to uh, retackle a tough job. Although widely questioned at the time, the recruitment of Alan Jeans was a masterstroke. The former St Kilda coach became convinced that Hawthorne still had the players to be successful, but the enthusiasm of some of the older players needed to be rekindled. He also believed he needed to introduce greater emphasis on the ball skills required for the modern running game. Jeans was supported by some aggressive recruiting. While the club still nurtured many of its players through the under-19s and reserves, it was now prepared to use the checkbook to attract players from interstate and other clubs. But they did go out and they spent money, and it's the first time in the history of Hawthorne Football Club they spent it in 50 on uh, Thompson, um, then Hudson, when he came across in the 60s, they spent a bit of money there. The only other significant recruits interstate-wise were Bowden Jaworski and Robert Day in the 70s. And Hawthorne had never spent money on players, but they went out in the 80s and they spent money and spent big money. 1981 was a year of coach and players getting to know one another. In the running for the finals throughout most of the season, crucial games were lost towards the end and the club finished just outside the five. Don Scott relinquished the captaincy to Lee Matthews and by the last game of the year, Scott had decided to retire. No one else knew it was going to be my last game, but I did know it was going to be my last game and uh, came to three-quarter time and naturally being, I was number one ruckman. I started the, the quarter and uh, the change came. I don't know when it was, 10-minute mark and out came the runner and 
I wasn't moving. <laughs> he said the change came out again, and I, no, I told a few expletives. Told them to go back. This is my last game of football. I'm going to play it out the way I want to play it out. Scott had represented Hawthorne in the then club record of 302 VFL games over 15 years, and had been a member of three premiership teams, two as captain. By early in the 82 season, it was clear that the Hawks were again a formidable combination. The Hawks went on to make the finals for the 10th time, and it was in the first semi-final against North that a red-headed teenager named Dermot Brereton made his debut. He remembers the phone call from Jeans informing him of his selection. He called me on the Friday night and said, um, I think we can fit you in for a game tomorrow. So I was pretty pleased about that, and he said he was going to play me on the bench. But uh, he did that to try and relieve me of any nerves or pressure that I might encounter and uh, any loss of sleep. It was Carlton, coached by David Parkin, that was to be the Hawks' stumbling block in 82. Parkin used his inside knowledge of the Hawthorne players' strengths and weaknesses to beat his old club twice in the finals and go on to complete back-to-back flags, a feat neither he nor his mentor, John Kennedy, had been able to achieve at Glen Ferry. Ron Cook had taken over as president and felt it was time that Hawthorne became fully professional off the field. And the biggest worry for me as president was that I spent half my time coming down talking to players and their managers on contracts. And it had got to the stage where you, um, the handshake had gone out the door and you had to have uh, good contracts, contracts fair to both parties. And it was an expertise that was needed to, to make your club professional. So a major restructure took place. Peter Becker moved from general manager to the specialist role of marketing manager and the club went in search of a chief executive. About the same time, the VFL announced the formation of the Sydney Swans and approached the Swan Hill local government executive and president of the Victorian Country Football League, John Lawrence, to take charge of the new club. Lawrence knocked it back, but Ron Cook had spotted an opportunity and was quickly on the phone. Ron rang me on the Monday and uh, I gave him a few ideas that I thought might help Hawthorne with its uh, administrative arrangements. He said, oh, thanks very much. The other thing that the board decided was to appoint you as the new chief executive. Well, that's incredible. Twice in a week, virtually, I had no intention of leaving local government, and I've been offered a similar role at two clubs. The restructure was completed by the integration of the football and social clubs and the club settled down to tackle the 83 season. Nothing less than the club's seventh grand final would do. One player in particular found that senior sergeant Jeans meant business. One night he was a bit disappointed in not being included in the side so he wanted to have a man-to-man talk so we eventually had a man-to-man talk. And the, and the side was read out and I wasn't in the side and I just, you know... Hey, Jeansy, I want to talk to you. I should be in the side, you know, sort of thing. Well, Jeansy, in his typical way, just said, uh, listen, Sonny, uh, just uh, you know, come with me and have a talk about it. Well, we went down to uh, the trainer, uh, there's a, a, a coach's room downstairs in the old rooms there. As soon as I walked in there, it was virtually just against the wall, arm up, spread my legs, threw me against the wall, you know, and I started crying. And then and there, he said to me, look, do you think you're... Do you really think you're serious? Have a look at you. You know, you're drunk. If you've, you've, you've sort of disgraced yourself and the club being the trainers like that, you know, who do you think you are? You, you think you're serious, you know? You're training, okay, you're talking, you're training very well. Look at your diet, you're not really fit and, and all that sort of thing, you know? And I said, oh, I'll show you. I'll bloody show you. And uh, from there, we had that, that agreement, that little sort of contest between us. And uh, from there, we've become good friends and, you know, he's like a father figure to me. Russell Green, recruited in 1981 from St Kilda, was another player who rose to the challenge. On New Year's Eve in 82, after we had finished third, uh, on his own volition, he said, uh, I'm not going to have another drink until the night of the grand final. And uh, other players started to follow suit. I didn't know we were going to win the premiership in 83, but I knew one thing, that uh, when players start to make these type of sacrifices, they weren't going to run up the white flag without having a fair income go. The Hawks finished in second position on the ladder, then narrowly beat Fitzroy in the qualifying final and comprehensively disposed of top team North Melbourne to be first into the grand final. 
Their opponent was Essendon, which had been impressive in winning its way through from the elimination final. 110,000 people roar as umpire Neville Nash comes in to bounce the ball for the start of the 1983 grand final from Melbourne Cricket Ground between Hawthorne and Essendon. Clayton gets the first tap out. Let's see if there are those mistakes we were looking for. Eat again, kick number two. Knights and Matthews clash the two veterans. I always remember John Kennedy saying, and uh, I don't care if two Hawthorne players collide, that means they're on the job. I don't care if they hit themselves. So when you see that happen, you knew that everyone was on the job. And I still remember, yeah, I was smacking the middle, and I thought, God, you know. Tries to get it back to Loveridge. Wallace, first kick, folds in the back of his opponent, Gary Bacanara, who's got the free kick and in trouble. The Hawks suffered a major setback when Gary Bacanara shattered his knee early in the first quarter, but the signs were still positive. What a blow for Hawthorne. Coming into meet it is Rodney Eads, showing a lot of pace. There's a bias, it's all right, and a goal of Lovebridge. And Hawthorne gets the first goal on the board. When David O'Halloran tackled uh, Daisy Williams and the ball was smothered, and I think John Kennedy picked the uh, ball up and kicked the goal, I knew then that everyone was mentally right and prepared to do their utmost to win the game. Well as Williams, he's in a bit of trouble, he's grabbed. Here's a go now for Kennedy, have a shot at goal, and he's put it through for goal. That's their second. We see the kick by Ayers, who's played a very good first quarter. The ball back out there. Brown again as Bob Skilton tips. Looks as though he's ready to fire today. A quick hand pass to Green. He's been a pretty quiet player so far. A hand pass out to Swab. Swab boots the ball long over the centre half forward position. The back fly. Matthews steps the ball down a duck. And Tuck has a pot shot at the goals. But will it make the distance? It'll be a goal. Looking for Matthews. Heard. Oh, beautiful one hand. They're just not uh, completing it enough. Matthews, a shot at goal. Oh, it's a jam! Mew gets it over to Kennedy. Kennedy short, Ede on centre wing. Oh, they're breaking away clear now as the ball goes over there to Wallace from Ede at half four. This looks dangerous, a long shot at goal up there to Burn and Miles. He's put it through. Weston goes straight up centre field, looking for Merritt. McCarthy, the knock on is there by Merritt, opens it up for Williams. Oh, Robertson top one, but comes through beautifully. Well done, Colin Robertson, that was guts. Oh, here's the runner, Robertson. Almost throws that one out in front of him for Terry Wallace to pick up, which Wallace does at right half forward. And it's up there towards the forward pocket, coming out as little Loveridge. So he's got the mark about 25 metres out from goal. Gene's on the phone, don't tell me he's worried. At this stage of the match, we see a goal put through this time by O'Halloran. Rodney Ead going after it, and the ball is out of bounds. So at the 30-minute mark, we see the score. There's the silent. But there's their coach, Alan Jeans, and what a happy man. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. It was Hawthorne's fifth premiership, its third in eight years, and by a record 83-point margin. Hawk Colin Robertson was a judge best of field and winner of the club's first Norm Smith medal. Jeans paid credit to Matthew's leadership. Lee as captain, I thought he, uh, you know, really showed his class as a captain and... Uh, he um, just the way he handled everything through the final series and the preparation and training and he sort of really came to the forefront as a leader just on, out on the training track for the last four weeks before the final series and right through the final series and he, he capped off a wonderful career. You know, he won eight best and fairest years, we all know, but he hadn't captained the side uh, to a premiership and uh, he got his just rewards on that particular day. Yeah, to uh, to actually go up there and uh, and hold the Premiership Cup to the crowd, yeah, that was uh, that was always a very proud and cherished moment. Acutely conscious of past disappointments in the year after a Premiership, the club made a concerted effort not to slip back in 1984 and always looked certain to make the finals for the third year in a row. Two of the club's great champions, Lee Matthews and fullback Kelvin Moore, played their 300th games during the season. Kelvin Moore, one of the greatest ever fullbacks, capped off a brewing career today when he played his 300th game. The club finished second to Essendon, which had improved and was playing with a fierce determination to eradicate the memory of the 1983 grand final. On the eve of the finals, the club had to deal with a rather unsettling incident. Bombers coach Kevin Sheedy and a keen supporter had supplied police with a videotape showing the Hawthorne players sniffing something from a bottle during the quarter-time breaks of the qualifying final against Carlton. 
the drug squad investigated and tests showed the mixture to be eucalyptus oil and smelling salts. Yeah, well, this is another disgraceful incident of uh, that, that you can laugh or remember a thing like that, but I can well recall coming to the club here on a Thursday afternoon, used to try and get here around about 3.30 and 4 o'clock, to be told that, uh, that the chief of the drug squad was here and that the club was uh, under serious suspicion for uh, use of drugs with their players to uh, enhance their performance. Well, I couldn't believe it. Hawthorne met Essendon in the second semi-final of 1984. Hawthorne triumphed by eight points and the dream of back-to-back -back flags was one step away. Essendon rebounded by thrashing Collingwood in the preliminary final and the stage was set. It was Hawthorne which settled best. And from the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, we begin the 1984 VFL Grand Final between Hawthorne and Essendon. The ball over the head of the pack. A bad miss by Foles that time. Going out as Robertson. He's a dangerous player. A shot for goal. This is not bad. Another one. That's their third. Two goals to Robertson. There's a chance for another one. Duckworth and Matthews. Both fight a good. Matthews goes down. He was nearly grabbed by the leg. And Ludbridge puts it through for another one. Oh, they're looking good, Hawthorne. There's the kick on its way. It's a high one. One quite make the distance. The pack. Oh, there's a great mark to Brereton. A beautiful mark. Decides to run around. He's threaded it through for another one. Judge gets the ball back to Wallace. Backing up well. Back to Judge again. This looks like a goal to me. If I've ever seen one, there it is. It's a beauty. Watson spins out of the pack beautifully. Gets away from Russo. The kick is not a good one. Finally picked up here now with a long hand pass from Dano. Over to Little Nezard. He gets the ball back to Williams. This could be dangerous. It could be a goal. And the little rover runs into the goal now. A hand pass coming over to Duckworth. And he scores the goal. Clark and Matthews. Matthews spins out beautifully. Left foot snap shot is pretty close. He's got it. What a goal. A 23-point lead at three-quarter time. But the signs were worrying. There's the siren for three-quarter time. The first time ever for the year I'd heard two players actually... Uh, squabbling virtually at three-quarter time over who had who, minding in match-up situations, and uh, that was very unsettling. And um, I know Genji was trying to calm the guys down. In front is O'Halloran. This is their goal. Baker puts it through. Oh, Bradbury, here's the goal. It's only a few points in it. Kick is an awkward-looking one. Coming over to Watson. This could be another goal. It is. Essendon's nine-goal burst in the last quarter snatched the premiership from Hawthorne's grasp. It was a bitter pill to swallow. Into this quarter by just on 35 minutes, there's the siren. Essendon winning their first flag since 1960. We unfortunately just really let a game slip, and that's probably, to me, when I reflect back on my career, the most outstanding disappointment that I've had in 15 or 16 years. The Hawks responded well in 1985 and played their way into the finals for the fourth year in a row but not before one of the darkest episodes in the history of the VFL, an episode that nearly ruined a great career. It's been fairly well documented. The game had turned fairly ugly, and, uh, and I suppose I turned fairly ugly with it in the end. The incident involving Lee and Bruns was uh, picked up in the corner of the television and subsequently led to uh, uh, an action by the police, and, uh, and uh, a great player was sort of vir virtually... Uh, sacrificed in, uh, over that whole issue. On Tuesday, Lee Matthews was fined $1,000 on a charge of assaulting Geelong's Neville Bruns. But the conviction has certainly left a sour taste in the mouths of the Hawthorne camp. Having to go to sort of court, and uh, that, that was a, a pretty horrific experience. You know, it was hard to believe you were in the court of the, uh, a legal court, court of the land uh, for something that had happened on the footy field. That, that, and that sort of, so it kept hanging on, that the incident wouldn't go away. We were very disappointed with the decision in the magistrate's courts, and we felt that we had an obligation to back Lee in by appealing, and that was duly done. And even though Lee had, in the meantime, transferred to Collingwood, we uh, sponsored his appeal right through, and uh, the decision finally was that uh, eventually uh, it was uh, struck from the records and uh, he was exonerated. After serving a four-week suspension for his part in the affair, Matthews returned to the side for the 85 final series. 
It was a great effort by the Hawks to make their third grand final in succession, but an exceptionally well-equipped Essendon side proved to be far superior in both the second semi-final and the big one. First quarter on the Seven Network of the 1985 BFL Grand Final between Hawthorne and Essendon. I think we can expect some fireworks early. Now they're having a go again. We tip this as it'll be on for Young and Old before it's over. Michael and McCarthy. Well, they're going in now and Hawthorne are not taking any funny business today. Look at them going in, piling in there. Players falling over left and right. You pick it up and you'll find the fighters there. Pete, you can afford to give them away on the half-back lover, not down there. Oh, here's a goal, here's a Put down your glasses, folks. Miles gives a long kick over the half-forward line. Brett at the back flies. He might have got that one. He's played it. On a 45-degree angle goal for goal number five. And there she is on its way. That's a good one. The Hawks are back in business. And no wonder he jumped in the air that time. Uh, Halloran has to beat four. Couldn't do so. Hawker's there for Eston. Out to Wood. Out to Merritt. Merritt steadies. 20 metres out. Slams it through for another one to Eston. The 78 point thrashing suffered by the Hawks on grand final day was humiliating and many commentators declared that Hawthorne's period of dominance had come to an end. Ball back into play again as it goes wide towards the half, or over the half forward line for Hawthorne. There's the Sire to win the game and Eston the Premiers for 1985 winning two in a row. 26 goals, 14 a it was a sad day too, because of the retirement of the club's captain and greatest player, Lee Matthews. After 340 VFL games, an amazing eight club best and fairest awards, 29 finals appearances, four premierships and 915 goals, the man they called Lethal Lee had played his last game in the brown and gold. That was really really sat going off the ground. About five minutes later, I had an enormous feeling of release of pressure because, I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to force my body to do things in that last year or so that really I just, just couldn't do. Grand final day also saw the retirement of another of the club's greatest champions, Peter Knights, who was one of a number of experienced players to miss senior selection and play with the reserves, which defeated a very strong Carlton lineup to win the club's fourth reserve grade premiership. The high-leaping Knights, whose career had been dotted by serious injury, finished with 267 VFL games, three senior premierships and a reputation as one of the game's best big occasion players. Matthews and Knights had played their first game with Hawthorne on the same day in 1969 and their last on the same day 16 years later. During the summer of 1985, Hawthorne was clearly at the crossroads. Soon after the grand final debacle, Ron Cook and Alan Jeans independently came to the same conclusions. Jeans needed to become a full-time coach and he needed the services of a sports psychologist. These decisions were followed by another court battle, this time over a South Australian rover named John Platten. Carlton tried to poach John Platten. They uh, put him on an agreement to play with Carlton and uh, we weren't happy about that at all. So we finally we got to the Supreme Court, went right down to the wire, and uh, Justice Vincent was going to give his decision the following morning, and our legal representatives negotiated with Carlton, and we came to an agreement and settled out of court, and John Platten was a Hawthorne player. Veteran Michael Tuck, in his 15th year with the club, replaced Matthews as skipper. I thought I would never have got the job. I thought at the time Terry Wallace might have got the job and I think 85, 84 I had a crook on, I had a bit of a crook knee and I wasn't playing that well and I think the club showed enough faith and confidence in me to put me captain and had a bit of a bad start but it turned out very good and I was very much honoured that they did. And for another veteran, the 84 and 85 losses were the launching pad for an incredible season. I actually started training the day after. I was so ch cheesed off with my own performance and, uh, and I just thought, well, I'm getting a little bit older now. I'll be 28 next year and uh, I want to continue playing. And so I started training and started running and running. And, and uh, I don't think I was, uh, I was so fit coming to the season in 86 because I trained every day since 85. 
the club decided to make something of the fact that 1986 was the 25th anniversary of its first premiership. A few of the boys from 61 are saying, let's get together and have a reunion for our 25th anniversary. And, and I picked the Yeston game at Waverley and I thought if there's going to be a game that we've got to get the 61ers together uh, and make their presence felt to the present day players, introduce them and, and get them together was, uh, was that for that game. And uh, sure enough, we went out in Waverley and we were on the ground and uh, all their little fat bellies and all the rest of the grey haired. But, mm -hmm. uh, but the players sensed that and they played an enormous game that day to beat Essendon. At the crossroads at the start of the season, and dismissed with the now familiar cry of too old, too slow, the Hawks responded in magnificent style. They stormed through the season, winning 18 of the 22 games. But a shock loss to Carlton in the second semi-final forced some serious thinking before they came back with a comfortable win over Fitzroy in the preliminary final and earned their way into their fourth successive grand final. The task of turning the tables on Carlton looked awesome. But first, there was a slight interruption to the team's preparation. officially announced that the first ever Brownlow medal has gone to the Hawthorne Football Club in the person of Bertie Devilaminico. Can you imagine how honoured I was? I was just over the moon to be Hawthorne's number one sort of Brownlow medalist at the time. I looked at Jeansy and he sort of gone, oh, <laughs> what have I learned? I created a monster here, so you know. Jeansy said, look, congratulations or whatever. Now you have the responsibilities of being a Brownlow medalist. And I'm going, is he always on my back? <laughs> Can't he say, look, that's bloody well done or whatever. But I understand why he's, yeah, what he said then. The 1986 Grand Final was a coaching triumph for Alan Jeans. He swung the side around to counter the strengths demonstrated by Carlton two weeks earlier. Perhaps the most dramatic move was back pocket Gary Ayres onto second semi-final match winner David Reese jones Ayres won the Norm Smith medal for the best player on the ground. But not before a nasty moment at the team meeting before the game, when Jeans wrote another player's name in his usual position of back pocket. My heart was thumping and I wasn't going to get a game and uh, anyway it came to the, uh, the wing position and Alan had put my name up on the, on the board so I was uh, very excited that I'd actually been in the starting 18. Deep here to Manico, scanning out brilliantly, drives the ball back to centre half forward. At the back is Buccano, he's taking that mark and rightly no, so the no mark. No mark, the umpire said play on, kicked off the ground. By halves over the rears, doing a great job on Reese Jones, tapped on by Dunstall. Beautiful play, and this will be a goal. And at about that, covered much distance. Di Pietro Menigo over the rears, the man of the moment, as it goes over the half forward line, punched out by Dool. As it goes for Bacanara, kicks it off the ground, it's going close, it'll bounce in for a goal. Hall looks the fortune, that's his second. Reese Jones. Reese Jones up to Schwab and Schwab marks. Madden getting a lot of hit outs but not directing them well. Hawthorne brought again in the forward pocket. Green onto his left foot. Duel in front of Dunstall. Dunstall gets in front of him and how did he do that? Snap shot is a goal! Dorotic and Burke. Dorotic strength from the wing. Carlton fans finding Boyce. Hunter over the top. No, Mew in front. Great mark by Mew. Jeans asked his players to play man on man and lay tackle after tackle in a bit to put the Blues off their game. of goal in the final quarter at the Dunstan. He's kicked five around Duell. Great tackle by Duell, but Dunstall brushes it aside. This might be the one that they needed. And finally, they break the ice in the last quarter. Knocked down by Deer on this occasion. There's the siren. And Hawthorne the premiums in 1986. The Hawks a season that had begun with a question mark hanging over the club had ended in the most decisive way possible. The biggest highlight of my career was when the players lifted me on their shoulders in the middle of the MCG after winning the grand final 
and you could just look around the crowd and 100 odd thousand people, that was the most, that's the biggest highlight in my career. Hawthorne's score sheet for 1986 included its sixth premiership, second successive premiership in the pre-season Foster's Cup, third successive McClellan Trophy for the combined performance of the first, seconds and thirds and its first Brownlow medal. The quest for back-to-back -back premierships was on again in 1987 and some of the biggest obstacles were off the field. The entry of interstate sides from Western Australia and Queensland and uncertainties about the ever-changing rules of the expanded VFL competition took the club back to the courts. The court was told that 28-year-old Bacanara had signed with Hawthorne for a two-year period from December 1984 and that Hawthorne Club had agreed not to exercise its options to retain his services for another two years. When the club did in fact exercise its options in July last year, Bacanara's lawyers sought action seeking his release from Hawthorne so he could join the newly formed West Coast Eagles in Perth. The court was told Bacanara's family lives in Western Australia and he wished to return for personal reasons. Bacanara, star half forward, was a member of last year's premiership side. Meanwhile, 23-year-old West Australian footballer Paul Harding is alleged to have made a verbal agreement to play with Hawthorne until 1989, but lawyers for Harding argue the verbal agreement was only an agreement to enter into a contract and should not bind him to play for Hawthorne. Mr Justice Beach disagreed, stating the verbal agreement was enforceable and granted the Hawthorne Football Club an injunction, restraining the two from playing football in Victoria or elsewhere for any other club except Hawthorne, until the hearing resumes in March. The battles were won, but not without a huge effort by the administration and a heavy financial and emotional toll. On the field, the Hawks had a patchy first half of the season, then impressively won a string of games to make the finals for the sixth year in a row, bettering the club's achievement in the 70s. Hawthorne thumped the Sydney Swans in that club's first final and led Carlton by more than five goals into the third quarter of the second semi-final, but the Blues came back to win and grabbed first berth in the grand final. The Hawks faced a rampant young Melbourne side in the preliminary final at Waverley, but that wasn't all they had to beat. The quarter time we went against it, we worked so hard and... Uh... Was sitting in the box and Des Mars said to me, those flags are going around the other way. I said, couldn't be. So, you know, our blacks are at half time and then for three quarters and yet not too many commentators or press people made any comment about it or didn't make a big issue of it. And over he goes to Jenky. Here come the Hawks again through Schwab. Schwab to Brereton. This is better football. It is Dermot. This will be a handy one to start the third quarter. There's the kick. It's a high floater. Look at that breeze. Take the ball. Goal. They duck back young Pritchard against Jackson. Well done, Ricky Jackson. He sprints, he bounces, he goals. A great goal. Now another loose man. This is bad play, Melbourne. Ray Jackie, 30 metres out, kicks, goal. Well, here's a chance for Bailey. Another goal coming up to Wilson. Brian Wilson kicks. Goals. Morris. Handball. Platten. In he goes. The ball comes loose. Paul Deere, handball, goal, Bacanara, and the Hawks are in it. It went from one player to another player, it found Bacanara. I ran across Bacanara because there was an open space in the pocket. Right, he was just about to kick to me, and Jimmy Steins ran across him. And I'm thinking, don't kick it to me, Bucky. Yeah, don't kick it to me, you know. And he was just about to kick it anyway, the 15 metres. Well, I was right behind Gary Bacanara. And there's nothing you can say to a guy. Pressure on Gary Bacanara. He is a champion. He is a great kick. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the grand final. The umpires haven't heard it yet, I don't think. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the 1987 grand final. If he misses, Melbourne are in. There's the kick. It's a goal. It's a goal. The irony of Gary Bacanara's role in getting the club into its fifth grand final in a row was not lost on John Lawrence. But when the decision was handed down, he came over to me and he shook my hand and he said, well, I've lost, congratulations, I'll now play up my career uh, in a Hawthorne jumper. And instead of the two years option that we thought about, what about we sign a three-year contract? That's the sort of guy Bacanara was. And I've got the greatest respect for Bucky and it was terrific for him to be able to kick that goal for us. While the team considered the prospect of successive flags, a back-to-back -back of another kind was in the offing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have dual Brownlow medal winners. For the second year running, Tony 
lockers. Guys, on, on, on a personal point of view, it's it's just something which uh, which 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 every player sort of strives for. On a, on a personal point of view, on, on a brand level, it's just uh, you know it's just a fantastic feeling as well. The preliminary final comeback against Melbourne had taken a monumental effort. When the grand final was played in 32 degree heat, Hawthorne's fate was probably sealed. Umpire Robinson to bounce it down. The start of the 1987 grand final. Hawthorne have got an extra man in the centre square. Remarkable. Carlton free kick immediately. It'll be taken by Johnston. Court just gets in the hand pass. Grabbed by Johnston. Johnston from 40 metres fires a goal. Brilliant play by the centreman. Yes, Russo has the ball on the outer side, plays on by Hander Collins, who runs up through the middle and kicks towards half forward. Good kick too into the path of Kennedy. He's inside 50 now, John Kennedy. Pulls it down towards full forward, gets the body, touch it. He claims he did. No, he didn't. Looking for Kenny Hunter. He's got it. A lovely hand pass from Hunter to Bradley. This is a goal coming up. Goal. The side considered by many to be potentially Hawthorne's best ever was softened up and then overrun by the Blues in the second half. As he brings it towards half-forward, the Hawthorne defenders try and get away with a beautiful play, Dorotic. Oh, gee, the bounce to Melbourne, this is a goal! Kicks it high, the pressure now on the Hawks, the big fist is away, here's a goal coming up to the Blues, into the open goal goes Gleeson, and it's a goal! Paul Deere swings it down towards full forward, Rhys Jones in front, race back for the ball, well played Rhys Jones, got goal side at Brereton. Kennedy... Opposed to Green, Green did it brilliantly, there's the siren. Robert Walls is elated. Ron Cook had overseen the biggest and most successful administrative changes at the club, stepped aside, job done. In typical Hawthorne fashion, another long-serving board member stepped in. Only the seventh president since 1925. You've got to do a fair apprenticeship at Hawthorne and uh, this is my 21st year uh, on the board. So uh, I had been round for a while beforehand. Boardroom changes aside, the club was still getting over the disappointment of again missing a chance at back-to-back -back flags when it was shocked by the news of a serious illness to coach Alan Jeans. Well, it was the medical people who sort of spoke to me first and they just said to me, uh, you know, I, we've got to just treat it like a, a knee reconstruction, uh, your whole medical treatment, that uh, three months complete rest and then it's just slowly rehabilitation from then on. And, uh, so they said, we'll just treat it like that and you'll basically be out for 12 months. Yeah, Ron Cook approached me as president of the club and, um, and he came to me and he said after Alan uh, could or wasn't going to go on in 88 and asked whether I'd be prepared to take it over. And I, uh, we had a, a brief discussion and the agreement was that I was to take it over for the 88 season. Uh, now, from that point I knew that the 88 season uh, was going to be it for me and uh, the agreement that I had with the club was at the end of that period, regardless, uh, I was to revert back to my original job uh, as director of football at that stage. I said at the time, I was saying now that it may have been a blessing that just a bit of a change through the period and then the next year Genji came back so it was just to break the monotony a bit, the training schedule and things like that didn't change a lot but just a different voice and and obviously everybody's got different ideas, so I think it did help a bit. Alan Joyce's introduction to VFL coaching went like a dream, winning the pre-season competition and then 19 out of 22 home and away games, the second time Hawthorne had done so. Such was their dominance, but even the antics of their bully at Brereton proved no distraction at all. One of those great moments just happened and Billy started laughing and I showed him that he, I was trying to show him that uh, he held no fears for me, so I kissed him on the cheek. Essendon's uh, huddle formed in front of my line path to uh, Hawthorne's and I just thought to myself, oh, bugger this, I'm not going round. So I just ran straight through the middle and got up a good head of steam, got halfway through and thought, this is great, and watched Sheedy go past me. Started to slow down and really started to get a bit... <laughs> what am I doing here, you idiot? And uh, clawed my way to the other side and finally got free of their um, mass. And uh, I remember Joyce looking at me and saying, that's cowboy stuff. And that was probably as, as big a um, dressing down as Joyce could come out with. En route to a sixth consecutive grand final, 
another Hawthorne player was establishing himself in the champion class. Jason Dunstall had a somewhat slow start to league football after arriving from Queensland in 1985. Yeah, the hardest thing was just uh, adapting to the training. I mean, uh, knowing my passion for running, um, it was just trying to keep up with whoever was running second last in whatever we were doing. That was the hardest point, and just uh, mixing with everyone. Unfortunately, Jace, when he first started off, he didn't have a great uh, physical condition, and it was under. I remember the first couple of nights down here, he ended up about a, after the two or three laps, he was about a half a lap behind everybody else. And Gossie said to me, who put the hand up for this bloke? And I had to, in a very gingerly manner, move my hand above my shoulder. But uh, no, Jace has just proved himself. He's a totally professional person. 1988 was the first of a series of 100 goal seasons for Dunstall, making him only the second Hawthorne player to achieve the milestone. I think it was at, uh, at Princess Park against Fitzroy. I actually remember getting a, um, a lucky bounce. I think it was over the head of Brett Stevens, and I ended up running into an open goal, which made it nice and easy. But certainly the crowd poured onto the ground, being our home game, and uh, I think the game stopped for five minutes or so while they cleared everyone off, and it was just uh, it was a bit of a mess there. For a while, I really didn't know what was going on. When the top of the ladder Hawks overcame Carlton to go straight into the grand final, many thought they were virtually unbeatable. I don't think Essendon's 85 side would have beaten our 88 side. We were just supreme everywhere. Very good side. And, you know, not only were we the best, we just were the toughest by far. Hughes will do the ruck work. Phoebe and Flint off the Melbourne bench. Umpire Brian Sheehan in his first grand final gets things underway. And Deer wins in the middle, gets it down towards Schwab. The hand pass misses Kennedy and crash they go through. Is Abbott, who's played every game this year. Way to Morrissey. Off to Schwab. Snap for goal and he's kicked it. Not and I think Melbourne there were three things in the second five. quarter against Platten. Melbourne. That, uh, one was when John Platten hit Dunstall in the chest from when it started to rain. And he kicked a goal. Dippy at Dominico from Morrissey. Kicked another one on his left foot and Dermot uh, screwed one back from the boundary line. Three goals. I think it was 17 points up. And those three goals at that particular period... Uh, put us up 34 points within probably three or four minutes. And talking to a lot of young players even today, that that's the difference between winning and losing. For one hawk in particular, the 88 grand final was a special occasion. There's Gary Ayres. I don't know what position Gary Ayres is playing. He's everywhere. It was a classic game in that everything you basically did came off. And uh, to have that in a grand final, it was very, very nice. And to win my second Norm Smith medal certainly was a big adrenaline surge for me or, or a rush. And I certainly remember that. With a left foot towards half forward Ayres. Great mark, Ayres. Superb mark. Alan Joyce took over as coach, took over from a legend. He's done it his way this afternoon. Congratulations to him. The Hawks going for a record here. Abbott on the run. Can he kick his sixth? He can! And that is a record margin in a grand final. The end result was a record 96-point victory, a record that still stands. In one of the most remarkable agreements in the history of the game, Alan Joyce was true to his word and handed back the reins to Alan Jeans with his perfect record intact. He rejected coaching offers from other clubs, including West Coast and Brisbane, and returned to a role behind the scenes. Yeah, we've been through Jeansy. Now, uh, Joyce uh, took us to a, to a grand final, and then he stepped down. It was just, it was just a, it was like a movie. The challenge in 1989 was not only to win the club's first back-to-back -back flags, but to equal Melbourne's record of seven consecutive grand final appearances. A sensational game of football in round six at Prince's Park gave a taste of what was to come. Over the shoulder, free kick to Kennedy, advantage paid to Platten, and Platten goals. Pritchard has lost it though to Buse, or Buse beautifully across to Robert Scott, over to Bairstow. Besto ducks and weaves and kicks long. It's a high floater. Now, Langford sets himself in front. Punches it away. In after. Kicked up the ground by Ablett. Goal! Geelong going forward now. Hawthorne looking for a tackle. Ablett from centre wing. Goes from 70 metres and kicks another one. Geelong went in at half-time with a massive 49-point lead. And, uh, I remember Genji at half-time saying... Uh, Let's try and get a few goals on them. Let's just try and peg them back. It's not all over yet. And uh, uh, to our bloke's credit, I mean, as he went in the centre, we made a few moves and they just came off. Comes to Platten or Mew. 
Chris Mew, over to the former Brownlow medalist. What a great kick to Hall. Brilliant kick. And to Brerick. Sensational football by the Hawks. Oh, nearly took the mark, but it's not there. Platten, the short one is on. Is that a free kick? The umpire didn't kick so double throw it in an open goal. And he's put his fourth through. Late in the first quarter, after starting sensationally, here's Morrissey again. A tap out was clever by Hall to Pritchard. Dippier to Menico. Back he goes. Shot for goal by Kennedy. He's got it. Dunstall can't break the tackle. Morrissey off the ground. The Hawks are in front. Well, what a game of football we've seen here at Princess Park. Geelong's 25 goals, 13, 163 is still the highest losing score in history. The club finished two games clear at the top of the ladder, but had a real fight on its hands to get into the grand final. Essendon started the second semi-final at a tremendous pace and quickly set up a good lead. By Greg Anderson, taps it up, punches it away to Long. The short one's on again to Buick. And he marks, and that's silly play by Langford. He's, He's played on. on. He didn't go over the mark. But it's a goal. You've got to go over the mark. No, he hadn't lined him up, Peter. The umpire hadn't called time on. Enter well, Dermot Brereton. Some strong play by all the... Oh, Brereton has ironed out with a hip and shoulder going to half. This allows Pritchard to come into an open goal. Darren Pritchard kicks. Is that a goal? Yes! That was hip and shoulder, no doubt about that. Vanderhaar wide open when he was hit. And Dermot Brereton, a great finals player. Now the session have slowed down a little bit. This is Buick. Oh, he's under enormous pressure. Brereton in hard. And that's holding the ball. Looks like Brereton's coming off. And Dippier Domenico was only off for about 30 seconds. Pumps it high. Dunstall. Oh! Pretty to watch. This for number six the bruised today. and battered Bombers submitted meekly to Geelong in the preliminary yes. final, setting up what was to be a sensational grand final showdown. I probably felt a bit more pressure on me personally because uh, of winning the Norm Smith the, the year before. And I thought too, we're in with our best chance that we're ever going to have of achieving back-to-back -back premierships. Yeah, again, I think we were probably the best side in 1989, although Geelong peaked at the right time and they were a, a very real threat. But I think we used the fact that we'd never won back-to-back -back premierships as our, um, as our main motivation. I'm going to try and stir him up today. I'm not going to let the same thing happen. Even if he does get rubbed out, at least he's going out, you know, I'll have him in full flight early in the game and all this business. So uh, I had said a fair few things to him in the uh, dress and, um, and I knew he was primed to go out and perform well. In the pre-match you mentioned to me that, um, that uh, not only was the aggression coming from me to other people but the gun was loaded and it was pointed at my head this time because I was under the microscope. Another Hawthorne player got an early hint of what was to come from a different source. The first words that Neville Brun said to me, and I'm playing my seventh grand final, he's playing his first, he said you're in for a big, you're in for a tough day you wogs. So, uh, yeah no worries look. Work and dear. Down by Burke. This is Buse. The second opportunity for Buse. Down towards the half forward line. Ablett's in front. Very interesting, Dennis, at that first bounce because uh, Yates came off the wing and went straight for Dermot Brereton. And Dermot's down on his knees, as you can see. Gary Ablett will go very close from here. From about 52 metres. Long probing kick. It's home. Dermot Brereton down. I mentioned how Yates came through the centre, didn't have eyes for the ball, just went straight at Brereton and has put him down. A bad miss for Hawthorne because he's the one who can really get them going. Bang whammy. <laughs> I saw Yates, he come in. I only saw him about a, a metre, metre and a half away. He was in pain. He was uh, rolling on the grass and uh, he was in pain. He, Sort of semi-concussed, but wasn't. He was just, you know, moaning and groaning, groaning, oh, oh, oh. After trying to build him up before the game and the things I said to him, the obvious answer was to leave him on the ground. 
Then the medical report came back that they wanted to take him off the ground, but Dermot didn't want to come. And uh, then the obvious response was to send him down into the forward pocket. So I just thought that um, if ever I'd felt any pain, um, how bad was it and what was I feeling now? And did it compare to that? And it wasn't as bad as the worst pain I've ever felt. So I uh, was able to deal with it mentally and went down into the forward pocket just to, you know, gather up my faculties or whatever. Scrambles it forward. Kennedy the opportunity. Sweeping hand pass over the top. Sends Pritchard away. Down towards full forward. Broughton the test here. He's taken the mark. What a courageous mark. Down in the first 15 seconds of the game. A chance to kick Hawthorne's second goal. From 25 metres out. He's put it through. It does inspire people a lot. Doesn't everybody know what doing this for? He really has a go at it. And I think that... That would inspire, and if it didn't, there was something wrong for you. Can't control it. Darcy, the first to recover, and Burton's in the action. Down goes Darcy, a free kick. Thurman getting knocked down in the first minute of play, and then to bounce back the way he did, it showed the true character and courage of guys that represent the Hawthorne Football Club. Cullen takes the ball, kicks the Hawks back into attack, in the 10 metre square, Burton! Clean mark at the goal square. Burton's a very... Courageous person, he's a very uh, candid person, and he's a very compulsive person. Those three things have got him into trouble over a period of time, but on that particular day, Dermy just proved to the whole football world what type of person he was. Brereton from the edge of the square, directly in front. No problems. Brereton certainly wasn't the only Hawk with problems. John Platten was KO'd twice in the first quarter and took no further part in the match. And two other stars were also badly hurt. I knew that I'd, uh, uh, that I'd hurt my ribs and, uh, and, and I had difficulties in breathing. But there was no way now I was going to tell anyone because I'm not going to play in the grand final for 10 minutes. I want to, I, I want to be there from the start to the finish. Views drops what he should have taken. Chance now for Flanagan and he busses his way out, but Ayers is there to tie I remember I kicked the ball down to uh, Jason near about, I think it was 20 minutes into the third quarter and I just felt this rip in my thigh and uh, I stayed on for another couple of minutes but it was like just being on one leg because every time you tried to run it just was this pain in the front of your thigh there. As the game wore on, another five players were added to the injury list. It's wide, oh, and a great mark taken by McGuinness. Tuck's got a problem, they're calling for Tate. Hawthorne had taken advantage of Geelong's manhandling tactics to establish a big break, but the Cats kept on coming. With one time hawk Gary Abbott simply unstoppable. One of two, Bacchanara from 10 metres out. Hughes comes away, there's the time remaining. The Cats are looking better. Hughes goes long down towards the pocket. Ablett! Oh, what a mark! Flanagan now doing the ruck work against Deer. Ablett over the top. Snapshot by Gary Ablett. This is close. Oh, it is mercurial stuff. Hughes gets around Lidner. Unloads into the forward line yet again. Kennedy in front. Ablett over the top. Oh, what a mark. Ablett finished with nine goals and a Norm Smith medal. Most goals in a final series. He puts it through. The Hawks have the numbers on this member's wing. Bacchanara. Over the top, Anderson. Into an open goal goes Anderson. And it's there. Hawthorne. But the Hawks hung on by just six points. And at last, those back-to-back -back premierships had been achieved. It was arguably Hawthorne's greatest moment. It looks like it's all over. The dream of back-to-back -back pennants is all but there as far as the Hawks are concerned. There's the siren. Hawthorne have won it by six points. A heart stopper. There's a courageous side, you know, that uh, bloody 89 grand final game. We'll go down in living history as far as Hawthorne is concerned. I put 89 as the, the greatest grand final win. In my time, I suppose it was the most courageous win I've seen in a group of people. You know, we were just walking and wounded, but the players just wouldn't give up and uh, you know, we got the results and uh, you know, it was our first uh, back to back finish. You know. The 1990 season, the first of the new Australian Football League, 
was always going to be a motivational challenge after the back-to-back -back dream, but the task was made even more difficult by a run of serious injuries to top players. The sickening head injury to Jason Dunstall during May was probably the worst. On there by Earl I rather hit the head and I, and I was just sort ground. of knocked a little bit senseless, so I think, and I on. remember the Melbourne guy saying, get up and, and get going, that, that sort of thing, which is, which is you know, par for the course in any footy game. Um, but then Terry Gay came out well, and had a look at it and said, you better come off. And I knew at that stage that there was something wrong. Even though I could get up and walk off, um, I knew something was just a little bit wrong. And by the time I got inside, it just started uh, beating in my head like, uh, you know, like someone was in there with a sledgehammer. Dermot Brereton also had to leave the field early in the same game, a crucial encounter with an informed Melbourne. But the Hawks were able to regroup and win convincingly. The highlights of the season were the two milestones achieved by Michael Tuck. In round 18, he became only the second man to play 400 games. It was a highlight for him, and nearly sort of a little tear jerk in the eye when you see the banner and when you in the rooms after the game and then we end up winning the game. Just four weeks later, he passed Kevin Bartlett's record to become the game's longest serving player. It was an emotional day, even more so for the generosity of the opposition. The thing I remember about that is that Melbourne said to Hawthorne that they'll line up with the Hawthorne players for a bit of respect for me, which I thought was good. And when I ran out in the ground, I'm clapping my hands, people wondered what I was doing, but I was just clapping the Melbourne players for doing what they were doing. The Hawks' strong run towards the finals faltered with a loss that day and they faced the same opposition at the same ground a week later in the elimination final. When Melbourne repeated the dose, it was the first time ever that Hawthorne had bowed out in September without winning at least one finals match. A remarkable record. And although Alan Jeans still believed the club had a bright future, he nonetheless took decisive action. A lot of people didn't realise, I think we had to win seven out of the last eight games to get to the finals that year, which was a great effort. And unfortunately, Melbourne put pay to us in those last two games. That, uh, and also, I think it was the third last game that year, we beat uh, Collingwood, the eventual premiership side, by 83 points out of Waverley. So I didn't believe we were gone as a force. It was just one of those years. But as from the club's point of view, it was very difficult for them and also difficult for me. And... Um, I just believe that uh, to avoid the club making a decision, it was best for me to stand down, so I decided to stand down. In a total of 25 seasons at St Kilda and Hawthorne, Jeans had coached 559 VFL games. He had steered the Saints to their first and only premiership in 1966 and had taken Hawthorne to the finals in eight of his nine years for three premierships. The club did not have to look far for a replacement. Alan Joyce took over the reins and again started with a premiership in the pre-season competition. But there were a few problems soon after, starting with an 86-point thumping at the hands of a new AFL side, the Adelaide Crows, in the first game of the season proper, and an 82-point hiding by the West Coast Eagles several weeks later. The cries of too old, too slow were heard once again. It was probably one of the, you know, the longest and hardest years I think I've ever put in, I think. We... Uh... You know, we weren't, we didn't travel too well uh, mid-season, and uh, we needed a lift. And the fortunate part of '91, in which football, you know, goes this way, that you need an impetus from, from probably some younger players coming into the side. While five players who had played in all four premierships in the '80s still remained at the club, Tuck, Brereton, Ayres, Dippier, Domenico, and Mew, Hawthorne had responded to the pressures of the salary cap by clearing a number of stalwarts and seeing others into retirement. Goes in solidly. Picked up by Wilson. The West Coast Eagles dominated the 91 season and finished on top of the ladder. But Hawthorne was steadily improving and secured its position in what was for the first time a final six. Even after ten consecutive appearances in the finals, the Hawks were still hungry. The four-goal loss to the Eagles in Perth just three weeks before the finals did nothing to diminish their confidence. In fact, it was a significant turning point for the team. We learned a lot that day um, in many areas, you know, travelling, the game plan, the things we didn't do, the things we did do. So to go back a few weeks later and, written, and have a go at them again was very important and I think it was a very significant to have them uh, twice in probably as many weeks. And going back again, I felt fairly confident and the players probably were uh, looking uh, to avenge what had happened a few weeks previously. And it was a history-making trip for the Hawks when they returned to Perth for the qualifying final. 
the first AFL final played outside Victoria. This is the 91 qualifying final. Irving and Lawrence to contest the opening bounce. Anderson gets it out to the play, going past in Hudson from 50 metres. He floats it up towards goal, and there's a good start by the Hawks. Jakovic tapping it down towards Langdon. Can't get clear. Kemper charge onto the left foot, pulls it around, and there's the quick answer. And now he's caught. Does get rid of the football towards Turley. With him is Barrett. Barrett he's hurt. Hurt, he's hurt himself. The knee, I think, as that shot by... But one major setback came out of the Perth game. Goes in for a goal. And Brereton is in deep trouble. He is, in, he is in a lot of pain down there, Sandy. But then again, we should reflect on that goal from Platten. I skidded onto the ground there with the, the, in the injury at there, that stage in the second the quarter. And my knee pulled open and I stretched the, right the ligament. Deep. So that's the end of my year. Comes in to take it. Getting help from the ground, like to have people cheer you being hurt. It's almost subhuman in my mind. Clever work by Whitman to use the body. Dunstall tries to sucker up the oh, shot and oh. kicked another one. What a sensational goal. Morrison. Long and low. Up towards Jarman. Worst ball went too early and it could be costly. Jarman's away. 35 metres out. He shoots in towards goal and has put it through. 23 points in it and it's Morrissey who brings it back into play again towards Pritchard. Lamb is there with him. Close to the boundary line and over. There's the siren. It was one of the club's most satisfying victories. But an old enemy still stood in the way of a grand final berth. Lawrence up too early. Pritchard for Hawthorne, the first decisive kick. I oh, broke the tackle well inside to Allen. Allen goes to Hall. Hall, an open goal, spritz in the goal, and Tony Hall slams through his second. Jamie Lamb taps it on to Hocking. He loses it to Hudson. Clutton back up support. Pritchard at open goal. Pritchard has slammed it through for a great goal. Langford taps it down. Here's Mansfield on the left foot. Michael Mansfield kicks it at goal and has slammed it through. Five seconds left now. Geelong need a goal. Gary Hockey. The last probably 35 seconds when the ball was kicked by Geelong. Uh, into the goal square and it was Gary Ayres who went up and took the whole pack behind him down and punched the ball through, you know, and I, if that had have been marked or a free kick, we were, once again, uh, we would have been out of that game because I think we won by, what, two points. There's the siren, magnificent victory to the Hawks. The Eagles bounced back to eliminate Geelong in the preliminary final and the stage was set for some more history. The first grand final involving an interstate club and with building works in progress at the MCG, the first and probably only grand final at Waverley. The venue was particularly appropriate for the Hawks, as they were in the process of making it their new home ground. Unlike Prince's Park, it was right in the heart of their supporter base. If anyone thought success might be spoiling Hawthorne, the scenes at Glenferry Oval for that last training run before the grand final showed that nothing could be further from the truth. The crowd was uh, overwhelming. Uh, I think there was various estimates of 12, 15,000 people here. They, they literally were hanging off the light bulbs. Uh, and the atmosphere was, was tremendous. Uh, the players responded to it and in the end the players uh, grouped on the ground and acknowledged the crowd that was here. It was uh, uh, quite an emotional, emotional time. With Brereton having made a speedy recovery from his knee injury, the Hawks went into the big game full of confidence. I remember on, on the board, and I suppose there were significant things in life and in footy, but I remember putting up on the board that we had to cause the problems in the West Coast Eagles back line. And to do that, Dunstall probably had to kick six. Uh, Brereton had to kick four, and Paul Deere had to be very significant to cause the problems. Hawthorne are making their way out onto the ground. And again, a huge roar. Gary to run out on the ground and hear the roar for us and have probably 50,000 people supporting us, and you know, maybe 15 or 20,000 for West Coast. It certainly was a big buzz. and. Uh, I remember that game for a long, long time. They'd written us off. They said we're too old, too slow, all the typical stuff. Here at the park. West Coast go to the left. Hawthorne to the right. Irving uncontested. Thumps it to half forward. Airs over the top of him. New in front of Jakovic. Who wins the tap. 
Wilson runs onto it, kicks the ball to goal, so bouncing, bouncing. Oh, no! For goal! Oh, the Hawks needing a goal here. Brereton, good effort, body to body, and winning against McIntosh, lays it off. Platten, 60 metres out, intended for Dunstall. Chance behind for Dia, open goal, it sits for him and he kicks it. It's a fight on in mid-square. Wilson Jenke is in the centre square this is going on. And Brereton's also getting involved with McKenna. Gets it on the ground, this is hard. Past the centre circle, chip passes intended for Sumich and what a good kick it was, honouring a great lead. Started well, already has two. Long kick, great kick. 5-1-3-6, Brennan favours the outer side, it's getting dark suddenly at VFL Park. Perhaps a chance of rain, Deer again plays on, 45 metres out from goal, this could be a lifter, it's a goal, great kick. Touched off the boot, McKenna sits and waits, Hudson, the handball to Morrissey, left foot, he can kick this, he has put it through. Well, this is where Deer can be very good, body to body, he usually wins out, that time he pushes McIntosh, Brereton looks for half a free kick, Deer cleverly with strength to Anderson, oh great kick for goal, look at that one, a beauty! Eagles start to run, they're going goal for goal at BFL Park. This is Pike, 60 metres out, long bomb. Eddie is going back, not required, it's a goal. Hawthorne leading by 11 points in the grand final. Lawrence has kicked a 4-4, Deer goes in and Brereton in the front spot. Collins comes to meet it now, 60 metres out from goal. Dunstall has the drop, he goes back in front, Brennan's fallen over. Dunstall deep in the pocket, measures the options, pulls it back, it's a goal! Oh, what a classic. And look at this, a panic for Gowers if it sits. Taps it over to Allen as the siren goes now and the Hawks win. You know, beating the West Coast Eagles at uh, Wavy was, was, you know, I, I, I could probably say it's probably one of the uh, most memorable ones I, I, I can think of because it's the first time um, out at Wavy, Wavy Park and, uh, you know, and to beat a uh, interstate crowd as well um, was, was just uh, tremendous. So Michael Tuck, the man already considered a veteran when he took over the captaincy in 1986, raised the Premiership Cup for the fourth time, equaling the league record for a captain. Hawk Paul Deer won the club's fourth Norm Smith medal. There was a poignant moment shortly after the final siren when Hawk champion Dermot Brereton consoled his young opponent Ashley McIntosh. He was a good player. I'd, I'd watched him during the year and, uh, you know, I could see the tears welling in his eyes and I, I grabbed him by the arm and I said, I've been where you are right now and I know it hurts, but it'll make you a better player. And I said, don't be satisfied with just being a good player. Be better than that. I said, you've got the ability to be better than that. And he just sort of thanked me. And so, um, you know, Terry Dunner had wished me luck once and said I was a good player when I was younger. Even after ten successive years in the finals for five premierships, Hawthorne's family club image was still intact. But in the intensely competitive National League of the 90s, a club can't be successful without taking hard decisions. Even the family club is forced to ask one or two of its favourite sons to move on each year. When that player has 21 seasons and 426 games under his belt, and feels that his 38-year-old legs can keep going for another year, such decisions are agonising. I said to Joyce in Coleman, I said that I would um, retire from captain and they could put airs your captain or whoever they wanted. And if I'm playing bad, well, they can just drop me, so there's no embarrassment to anybody. But obviously they didn't see it that way and they suggested it was time and I said, well, fair enough, there's not much I can do about it. I don't like the decision at all and I never will. And, but the thing is, I accept the decision. Tuck's role in the club's success was remarkable. His record 39 finals games, 11 grand finals and seven premierships is unlikely ever to be bettered. Nobody could respect Tuck more than his Hawthorne teammates, which would number several hundred. The thing that sticks in my mind most about Michael Tuck, and I would, I'm told it'd be similar to, say, a guy like Kevin Bartlett, they were both such great natural athletes. And to emphasise that point, in the early 70s they used to have what they called the Football Olympics when footballers would compete in just different running events and uh, 
Michael would win the 400 metres by like 10 or 15 metres against guys who were doing pro running. To captain the most premierships, it's, it's a great honour for any guy to have done that. And uh, especially when a lot of people said that, you know, Tucky was quiet and of course he couldn't do this and couldn't do that. And then of course he's turned out and he's been the best captain that Hawthorne's ever had in that respect. Gary succeeded Tuck as captain in 1992 as the club embarked on a campaign to equal the Melbourne Football Club's record of 11 consecutive years in the finals. It was a year of ups and downs, but the side was in top form by August and finished fifth. For the second year in a row, the club was required to travel to Perth, but this time it was an elimination final. Paul Deere got it down, Condon did well, Jarman from about 40 metres out, snaps and goals! Well, Mitchell White got a shocking bounce. Deers gives it away to Gowes. He'll have a shot in towards goal over the top of Westfall. It goes and bounces through for a goal. You can go on with it here. This looks more positive from the Eagles. In towards Sumich and Langford. Sumich quick to recover. Goes on to the right foot. It's high. It's coming back. Has oh, it come oh. back enough? Oh. I think it has. Anderson back on the ground. Gary Ayers off. Langdon, a long time to Pike, who snaps. That could be it. The players put up a great fight in what was undoubtedly the best game of the final series, but the breaks just didn't go their way. For only the second time in Hawthorne's history, the club was out of the finals after one match. The Eagles went on to win their next two finals decisively and become the first club to take the premiership out of Victoria. Meanwhile, Hawthorne looked forward to 1993 with great anticipation. If it could make the finals for the 12th season in a row, it would set a record that may never be broken. But after a patchy start to the season, there were some hurdles to be cleared along the way. Cleared as only Hawthorne knows how. Well, it was a great lead, a perfect kick and a very good mark. While constant success can breed contentment, at Hawthorne it inspires further success. The question that needs to be answered is why? Why has a club which spent so much of its history as a perennial loser been able to transform itself into a voracious winner? And why has it been able to do it at a time when the competition is stronger and more even than ever before? If you haven't got the players, you can't do any good, but the type of players you actually get to, you can get a, a, a real good players to wrap that. So I think that the committee themselves have done a very good job in structuring the side properly and looking after everybody. And, uh, and I think that they've got the right players, the match committee never got the right players at the club. We have been a very closely knit club.
club on and off the field. Uh, the players are fellows of very good character. They have respect for the board and for the administration. They are disciplined. And I believe that because of their discipline and courtesy and respect and training off the field, those characteristics are taken with them across the white line. And I believe because of that mental discipline, on the majority of occasions, they make the right decision when the crisis comes up on the field. That on balance, the, the quality of man here is excellent. Jeans is an outsider that comes in and he was mystified at how this club ticks. He'd say, you go down the trainer's room, they'd be entertaining down there, they'd be feeding the players. You could go up, be invited up in the boardroom and all of a sudden the trainers would be up in the boardroom. Or the board people could be down the trainer's room. I think it's been a one big family club and I hope it stays that way. If you've got a good administration, you can raise the money and get the right people in the right uh, areas. Because if you get enough money, then you can get the right players. And uh, if you have the right players and the depth to go with it, then you'll have consistency. And I think these are the things that happen during that period of time. I think it comes from within. Uh, the club does have a heart. And uh, I put it down to people. It's very much a people club. You know, Hawthorne are a very conservative club. I mean, when other clubs were going out marketing in my time, Hawthorne weren't doing any of that type of thing because of the nature of the individual. But they were very, they were financial and they were very uh, sound, uh, as I said, financially. And they were very conservative, the administrators. And they were very, very lucky in that time that they had a very good uh, recruiting area to recruit upon. We had a zone in Gippsland and uh, Frankston. We don't tolerate fools and players do the right thing. They're... They're disciplined and they react to discipline uh, on and off the field. They are, uh, there's always been a peer group of players that have, uh, that have had the respect of the juniors. There have been mediocre teams that won premierships. And I think mediocre coaches have coached good teams and they won premierships. But I don't think premierships have ever been won by a club that's badly administered. And I think I can know of some times when they've been marvellous players and a poor administration and they've just been a rabble on the field. And at Hawthorne there hasn't been a great number of changes and that's been because people haven't seen the necessity of it because they've performed and they've, they've kept Hawthorne in the forefront of their own uh, ambition. And then the pre-season for 81, I was invited to train with the, the uh, senior group. I just was in a 10k run and I ran along next to Lee Matthews and uh, I was doing it fairly easy and I thought, oh well I won't get in trouble if I come in along next to Lee Matthews. And while he was running he was puffing and saying he shouldn't be doing it this easy, you know, and he was struggling and I was doing it on the bit, being a lot younger and fitter. And then he said to me, when we were coming down Power Street, and there was probably about seven, eight minutes run left, he said, just imagine it's time on, the last quarter, and we're five points down, and how hard you run home is how easy, is directly proportionate to how much you're going to get of the ball in the last five minutes, and that's how we're going to win the game. And he dug in a little bit and I took off and ran home like a hairy goat because the great man had just somehow related a run on the road to playing football, you know, and that sort of thought, gee, you know, what is this game about? You know, what's this story about that you just don't take it easy just because you've got the natural ability to do so? And I suppose a lot of people do that.